Thanks a lot for joining. I'm Vanti, and I work in the container runtimes team at Red Hat. Um, in this team, we develop uh, and maintain a number of container tools and core libraries together with the community. And today, I want to chat with you about Podman and SysDB. So we really take the containers or Linux philosophy seriously. If it wouldn't be in a washing machine, I would, would wear it today. I guess I, I didn't plan, plan right wearing the t-shirt. And we take great pride in how well Potman integrates into a modern Linux environment. And well, systemd is part of that. So the talk is roughly split into uh, two parts, pretty much um, structured after the two scenarios that I want to cover, um, where containers in general and systemd come into play. So the first scenario is to run systemd inside a container. So really, we execute a container. And inside this container, we want to run systemd and interact with it. The second scenario is slightly different. It's to run a containerized systemd service. So imagine you do a system CTL start service A, and service A is actually a container. So uh, this somehow hopefully illustrates a bit what I mean by containers or Linux, or Linux. We really don't want to differentiate between an ordinary binary on the host or if the binary is executed on a container image. So let's first talk about the first scenario, where, again, we want to run systemd inside a container. So let's first elaborate on why running systemd in a container is a thing. So first and foremost, I think the most important thing is that systemd is the de facto standard in it on a modern Linux uh, desktop and server in a modern Linux world. Um, maybe it's already kind of kind of old, at least for over half a decade. It's the de facto standard on major Linux distros. And many of our workflows really depend on it. Um, as you can see below, there's a snippet from a Docker file where we want to build a container. So we have a base image. We use Fedora. We want to install an HTTPD server. This is some of the, the classical example for why we need systemd to run inside a container. And then we enable it. So in this case, it'll, it'll start to boot. And the command is aspin in it. So without proper support, we're thrown back really to the to the dark days before init scripts. And this is a royal pain in the bottom because users can't just use the same scripts, the same workflows to install their packages and their tools. And as a vendor uh, for, in this case, Red Hat, it's also horrible um, because we really have one way to install and use these packages. And we want to have, you know, we don't want to differentiate between um, using it on bare metal, using it on a virtual machine, or using it in a container. So without having systemd support in it, we can't have that. So it would be hard, or it was hard initially, to support it. And users and customers, they were forced to write some of bash scripts uh, manually to start, sometimes install, and run their tools that usually just work. So when we look at what system D needs to run, um, it's not so much. You know, we we gotta powder the bottom a little bit uh, of the mounts to make system D happy. And in in fact, there's a couple of things here, just a couple of examples that we need. Um, for instance, we gotta um, mount run run lock and slash temp as a tempfs, then. The, C group system D and Warlock journal, they must be writable. Also makes sense. You know, system D wants to manage the C group and it also wants to be able to write to the journal. Also, the system D C group is bind mounted into the container. And um, most importantly, also system D must be and wants to be the PID one in the PID namespace of the container. Um, it's the init system, so it wants to take care of our household. So it wants to reap zombies. It wants to take care of everything. It wants to manage the services, and this only really works as PID one. So when we look at how we can run systemd in a container, if you're using Docker, you can use the OCI systemd hook. So Docker does not support running systemd natively. So we had a we had to find a solution for users and customers, and this OCI systemd hook. 
as it's in the name, it's an OCI hook that OCI conformant uh, runtimes like RunC and CRun will execute. And the nice thing by using the hook is that it's entirely transparent for Docker and also us, the users, and it works securely. So initially, um, Docker didn't want to merge PRs that would support it natively. Um, so many years ago, you know, there were, were lots of resources, how to run it, and usually all of them included using the privileged flag, which is really bad. You know, we don't want to run privileged, uh, con you know, privileged container by dropping all, nearly all security mechanisms um, just to run systemd. I'm, I'm usually joking that running or using privileged flag is like running naked, but with your shoes. You still go from A to B, but everybody can see what's underneath. And so this was this was far from being ideal. So it may not come to a surprise to you that Portman supports a system D natively. So this system D setup, you know, where we set up all these uh, these mounts and massage a little bit the config to run, can be triggered in various ways, explicitly by using the dash dash system D flag and set it to always, or implicitly. So when Portman is about to execute a container where the entry point or the command is pointing to init, so there's a couple of permutations of it. You know, it can be sbin init, it can be bin init, uh, some other paths that it goes through and checks. If that's the case, well, then the mount will be set. And if you want to opt out for whatever reason, you can also just do that by setting the system deflect to false. So here, a rough, con uh, a rough um, example. The bandwidth here, I'm, I wanted to give a demo, but the bandwidth in my home office here is limited. Uh, so I was afraid uh, of it. Then I'll, I'll prefer just to give the snippet here. So highlight in green, you see the, um, the commands that I executed as a rootless user. So here we are running the UBI in it. Um, container image. So UBI is a cool thing. It stands for universal base, base image, and it's an well, no, OCI compliant container image based on RHEL, and it's free to use. And it comes in a couple of flavors. And in this case, it's pretty cool because it comes um, with a pre-installed systemd on it, at least on the UBI A dish in it um, container image. So in this case, I execute a con container. I named it systemd. If I run Portman top systemd and query for the PIDs with the associated commands inside the container. We can see that systemd is PID1. And then there's also the systemd journal and the dbus daemon running inside with PID11 and 20. And to illustrate a little bit further, if you run Portman exec and you do a systemd CTL to list the units, you know this is working too. Systemd just runs fine in it. Um, so this is really cool. Um, it's simple. And for us, uh, in this case, by us, I mean Red Hat, um, it's just more easy to support because it doesn't make a difference whether you're running really on a, on a virtual machine or bare metal or on inside a container. And for users and customers, it's nice because they can just use what they were using before. Um, so let's jump to the next the next topic. I have around, yeah, I'm around 50%, so I'm well in time. So the second scenario is running containerized systemd services. So in contrast to before, where we wanted to execute systemd inside, we want to use systemd, so systemd services, systemd units, and execute them in a container. Um, so systemd is already managing all kinds of services on the system, and users should be able to easily run and manage containerized services as well. It's somehow, you know, a marriage between uh, the two things. Um, users want to make use of containerization and all the benefits. And there really, again, shouldn't be a difference if you just run an ordinary program or a container. And this is where we brought Portman to. But writing a system D unit manually is really challenging because we have to think about a lot of Things. So systemd wants, wants to manage the resources, including all the processes of the service. Um, a client server architecture doesn't feel, fit well into this picture. So if you want to do this with Docker, um, it's, it's really tricky. 
because when you run docker run foo the process is ex or the containers executed by the server but we're executing the client so really this breaks up the the process management of system d so it's it's really really tricky there's many pitfalls and writing robust system d units is even harder you know, you got to worry about the dependencies. Um, how, uh, uh, the, you know, what is the order in uh, of the boot of in it of starting, etc. How do we handle restart policies correctly? Uh, what happens if the system suddenly reboots? And also, we got to worry about what is the main PID when you run Podman. There's a lot of programs uh, involved. So if you joined the session before, Cure, Dan, and Giuseppe, they were talking about a lot of things like Fuse Overlay FS, Run C, and C Run, and Conmon, and all these kinds of things are executed below. And for sure, you've got to worry about C groups, the type. I think you, you get where I'm pointing to. Um, Potman makes it easy. So with Potman, if you use Potman, you don't need to worry about all these things because we did that already for you. So if you use Potman generate system D, you will get a nice uh, system D unit file or more unit files in case you want to generate system D units for a pot in contrast to a container. And initially, Potman um, generate system D supported only created containers. So the exec start and exec stop sequence in this service or the system D unit, they merely did a potman start and a potman stop. So really the container had to already exist, to pre-exist when you execute these, um, these services. But we gradually Im improved it over the last two years. Pretty much with each new release, we, we polish um, the, the features and get system D and potman closer. So we extended it so now it can create containers and also pods on demand. We further extended it to, to support pods. So when you generate files for a pod, there will be one for the pod, namely the init container, and then each um, container that lives inside the pod. And Podman Generate System D takes care of all the dependencies. Um, it starts them and restarts them accordingly. All these things are really, really, really hard to do manually if you want to want to do it on your own. So if you're interested on it, um, interested in it, please have a look at the man pages of pretty much just type man Podman Generate System D. There is a lot of information, especially for using these unit files as an ordinary rootless user. There's a couple of things that you need to do, uh, for instance, if you want to start these unit files uh, at boot time. All these things just look there. So here's an example of such a generated unit file. As you can see, well, there is a lot of stuff happening. And pretty much the bottom line of everything I said for the second scenario is don't try this at home. Really use Podman Generate System D. Those are services uh, or the unit files that we can support. They're battle tested. They're used pretty much everywhere, and this is something we can support. If you try to write them yourself, you're mostly on your own. These are really hard to support, and those are the ones that we really can support uh, as an upstream. Um, so really use Podman Generate System D. As you can see here, there's a couple of things that I highlighted just to illustrate uh, a little bit on the complexity of using it. I think I have four minutes left until I want to answer questions. Um, so you can see that we worry about the container ID. Um, we need to store some data persistently so that we, that we know pretty much which container corresponds to it. Um, we got a worry below in red, you see the PID file and we set the type to forking. Uh, someone pointed to, to that a couple of minutes ago. Portman implements a traditional fork exec model in contrast to Docker, which implements a client server model. So when you run a container with Portman, the container itself is a child process of Portman. So in this case, you know, we fork. So we tell systemd we have a forking um workload that we want to execute inside the system d unit and so we got to tell system d at some point which is the main pid otherwise system d will guess and since there are so many tools involved you know as i mentioned before common run cc run uh, fuse overlay fs um, all these kinds of things 
pod, or, sorry, systemd might guess wrong. So this is the place where we tell systemd explicitly what is the main PID. And so there's a lot of um, massaging that we did over the, the past two years or so. Lots of work that went into hardening these unit files and also testing them. So now I want to give a brief example of how powerful you know, the, the tight integration between Podman and systemd is, especially how the two can be used to build somehow more complex, higher level logics. And in this case, I want to talk about edge computing. So while there are many diff definitions of edge computing, uh, I hope that we can agree that it's a deployment outside of a common server room. I think that's the, um, the smallest common denominator um, that most people use for edge computing. So in general, accessing our deployments is more challenging and sometimes physically impossible. Uh, recently, I was uh, talking to a customer who uses uh, Portman System D on an oil rig. Uh, yeah, if you're a sysadmin, you might not always be able to access your server. And automation is key for these use cases in edge computing. So we were tasked with auto-updating running containers. So it may not come to you as a surprise that we relied heavily on systemd to help us do that. So the idea was that we can already run Podman containers inside a systemd unit. And systemd has this beautiful dependency management features and can take care of everything. And so since Podman 2.2, um, no, since Podman 2.0, actually, since last August, there's the Podman auto update command, which is now um, feature complete in Podman 3.0. So you can use it. It's not marked as experimental uh, anymore. So what it does is to update um, a container. It will recreate the container as soon as there, the image that the container was using has been updated on the registry. So it's a, just imagine you have a fleet somewhere an IoT fleet um, that uses a specific container image. You update the image on a registry, and at some point, your entire fleet will consume the updates automatically. So if it's an event-based update, you can execute Podman auto-update um, yourself or trigger the auto-update service. If it's a time-based one on all installations, on pretty much all distributions that um, Podman is packaged for, there's also a Podman auto-update timer. And this is, was, was really, really simple in the end to implement given we could make use of systemd. As Portman is a daemonless, uh, or has a daemonless for exec architecture, you know, um, we, were, we were thinking quite a lot on how, how we can implement, implement it because, you know, we got to manage a lot of state. We got to know which containers manage for auto updates. Um, it must be a smooth experience. It must be reliable, and it must be as reliable, you know, to, to run on an on oil rig offshore. Um, so systemd was was perfect for it. The, the simple trick that we used is that we uh, pass down the systemd the name of the systemd service into the container um, via an environment environment flag. So Portman really knows which container corresponds to which system D unit. We pull down the image. Once it has been pulled down, assuming it was a new one, we restart the service. So there will be a downtime, but it will auto update. And that's pretty much it. I guess we got four minutes left. And if you have questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you, Phantom. That was a great talk. Uh, there have been a few questions in chat, but they are also being answered in chat. There was one that didn't have an answer. I can read it out loud for you. Um, is there a good advice on why the Podman generated systemd starts to fork the units versus not forking it? It would be nice with logs and status in the systemd status. That's a good question. So we're the answer is yes and no. So at the moment, we need to have it forking, um, but this doesn't necessarily impact the logging of it. So if you miss the logs in system CTL status, um, with Portman 3.0, it will be a smoother experience. Um, we are actually, actually did a lot of work to um, polish the journal D driver. So there's a couple of, of logging drivers, so-called log logging drivers in Portman. Um, 
In older versions, those were file-based, so all the logs were written to a file. But now, since Podman 3.0, the journal D logging driver is feature complete, um, you know, on pair with the file driver. So if you create a container and set the log driver to journal D, all the logs will show up also when you do system CDL status. Um, as I mentioned before, with pretty much each new version of Podman, we polish and massage the integration with systemd. And one thing that we really want to do this year is to change the, the type of the systemd units to notify and really use the dbus to you know, do all the communication of the main PID to communicate when the container is ready, all these things to get even closer to it. And this will um, so make uh, or remove quite a lot of clutter and noise from the generate for, from the generated unit files. Thanks. The next question is: What are the main use cases you're seeing for running System D inside a Podman container? Well, the the main use case is um, you know for any any package, any kind of workload that needs System D. Um, in this case, you really want system D to run inside the container. Um, otherwise, uh, as I mentioned initially in the talk, you're you know you're, you're thrown back to to what I was joking the dark days before init scripts, where users had to write their their own init scripts. So in in some cases, um, some web servers, as for the HTTPD example that I gave initially, really need system D or want system D. And some packages actually need it also at installation time. So there's a, I think it depends on the workload that you're running, but from a vendor perspective, we really want it to go there because otherwise it would be very hard for us to support it if you know, each user was on their own to implement um, custom bash scripts to, to start up their services. Thanks. Uh, the next question is, how do you compare to the Nomad solution from HashiCorp? Um, I, I don't know. Uh, I honestly can't, uh, can't answer this question. So I know that uh, Nomad has a driver uh, for Podman. So I'm, I'm not sure if we're really competitors I, or if the tools are, are competing. So Nomad actually has a driver for uh, Podman now. So I think we're, we're interacting well with, uh, with Nomad at that point. Um, I know there's some ongoing effort for Nomad, for the Nomad Podman, for the Podman Nomad driver to use um, the latest and greatest um, API that came with Podman 2.0. So with, since Podman Tito, since Podman 2 at all, we support uh, we ship a uh, new API, which is REST-based and also compatible to Docker. So in this case, it's uh, a seamless seamless migration. If you were using the Docker API before, you can smoothly migrate now over over to Podman. So maybe you were pointing to something specific at Nomad, but I'm not experienced at all with Nomad. So um, maybe we can take it offline. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, next question is, can I run multiple services within the same systemd-based containers? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you run systemd inside a container, you can start all kinds of services inside. Yep. Um, the next question is, is Podman generate systemd fully supported in RHEL and SLE? Uh, Dan answered it. It's supported in RHEL for SLE. Do you know? Yeah, uh, for, for SUSE Linux Enterprise, I would give the same answer as Dan. Uh, I think reaching out to SUSE would be uh, the best answer. I, I, I can't talk for them. OK. Um, but in case of RHEL, yes, this is, this is fully supported. And it's used all, all over the place. So I'm here and there, um, you know, some, some colleagues in, in sales uh, or some architects uh, reach out with uh, some question or anecdotes of where system D and or where these unit files are used or where auto updates is used. And this is really super exciting. Uh, as I mentioned before, you know, on an oil rig offshore, this is just really cool. So if if you use them, please reach out to me. I always love to know where where our tools uh, are used and if there's something we can do to 
improve your experience. Yeah.